the member and co-creator of uh, of Netflix's Astronomy Club, the sketch show, Mrs. Keisha Zoller. Keisha Zoller, thank you for being here. Of course. Thank you for having me. Totally. Of course. Yeah. This has been a total pleasure just chatting about uh, Oakland and San Francisco yes. and about uh, lives in general while you, while you hung out for the previous 30 minutes offline. And now here we are online. Thank you so much for doing I'm this. I'm happy to talk about the Bay Area. Online, offline. It's it's so funny. I haven't lived there for years, but it's always a special part of my heart. That's hella, hella special. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now you're bringing me back to my college debates of like, I went to school at UC San Diego and it was always the debate between NorCal and Sor. Like I said, SorCal, like that's a thing, like it's Sorbet, but Southern California. And it was always like the hella. And I yeah. broke my habit that I used to have very badly in, in California. I would said, dude, a lot. I was a duder. I do that constantly. And I've had to break the habit of ever, if ever I slip and call my wife, dude, it's like, oh God, I got to reel that back. I call Bob, dude. I call Taro, dude. I mean, dude is very prevalent in my vocabulary. I just need to absolutely rein it back and make sure that my romantic life and the word dude never intersect. And then my, my husband also teases me as a Californian because there's certain sound changes that Californians have. Like we have the open sound yeah. and that's, and I, and I can't say boot, right? Boot. I that can't. sounds like boot. I know what I, you're talking I, about. I think it. And he's like, and he always like points and laughs at me. And I was like, okay, Long Island, calm down. <laughs> so my husband's from Long Island. He can chill with the, you got a weird almost accent. I was like, I sound like I'm from California, which means almost nothing. Yeah. I got, I got, I ended up moving to Northern Michigan my sophomore year of high school. And I said the word doc, just doc, like doc of the bay, doc yeah, on a lake. Doc. And people would give me shit about my accent. Cause they would say it doc, like the, like the doc. really Midwestern way to say it. I'm like, dude, you sound like a fucking extra in Fargo. Like I'm saying the word doc, there's no accent here. Pretend maybe there is a little bit, but you know. Well, it's because we really round our sounds. And I learned that when I was in acting school that I was like, apparently I, I say Boston weird, like everything's open. I was like, that makes sense. California, everything's open. We're, we're open. I, I'm into it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too. not ashamed. I'm proud of it. Open those vowels. I, yes, I take, take every opportunity I can to go back. I enjoy it out there. I enjoy it out here. This is awesome. You do both things. You're a bi-coastal person. I am. I always describe my personality to people as I have New York chill, but I'm a California neurotic. So in California, I'm like, ah! <laughs> but here everybody's like, you're so calm. Yeah. You're so like relaxed. And I was like, I don't feel that way, but I guess in comparison right. to the city, yeah. I'm really chill. You'd have to be an absolute wreck in life to be perceived as neurotic in New York City. Yes, that is 100% true. And in California, everybody's like, calm down. We can do it next year. Yeah. What are you, why are you stressing? <laughs> we'll tomorrow. What is the, that California philosophy? Just make sure you get one thing done every day. Even if that thing is just going to the barber, you did your one, the one thing. You did done. a thing. Yeah, that's it. You man. did it. And I, and in New York, you're like, oh, you didn't do 10,000 things. Yeah. <laughs> you're doing 10,000 things. So congratulations to you because Thank Astronomy you. Club, the sketch show came out pretty recently, it came out uh, in December on Netflix. Um, I watched the entire first season last night. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it. And there is, um, uh, I would, Jesus Christ, that was a train wreck of a sentence. What I'd like to ask you is how did you transition from um, a UCB sketch troupe into what it exists as now on Netflix. Like what does that development look like between, uh, between the live world and, and the internet world? Well, it's, it, it feels like it was a slow evolution, like in retrospect, because we actually got together in 2013 um, and we mainly just focused on doing improv and we became a house team at UCB. Uh, we're all black. If you didn't know, now, you know, uh, and it, then we like started doing a sketch. We did a sketch for Black History Month and we were like, oh, we kind of liked writing that sketch show and performing that sketch show. We was got that Black History Minute or was that a different thing? Oh, the Black History Minute. That was just me. Okay. I just, you know, I love being black and writing about being black and writing about other things too, but I'm black all day. So I will always find a way to be like, whoop, black history. Let me do a little something. 
It's uh, nice for me for one minute to be vicariously black through you for just that one minute. I mean, there is... I mean, there's a lot of people who ask me that and I say no, but for you, maybe I'll think about it. It's still not a yes. Uh, but uh, so we did that and then we had a digital series with Comedy Central. And from there, it like really like helped us grow and then be able to get to yet another streaming platform, <laughs> Netflix. So I feel like the the bridge to how we got there was pretty simple. Yeah. It like in that way... Over, Though it took like six years to get that there. Right. And so what what is happening with the troop? I mean, Astronomy Club exists outside of the context of this Netflix show also. What is what's Astronomy Club up to outside of the uh, of the internet world? Well, we do live shows. We have some live performances coming up. Uh a few like I think we're doing a few shows like in the late spring, early summer in New York. We do sketch and improv and uh, a variety of things. So I think it's to do even more live stuff. We have other ideas in the works too beyond sketch. And uh, cause there's eight of us and it feels corny to say, but it's a hundred percent true. Everyone in astronomy club, I respect so much and think is genuinely a star in their own right. There's not one person I'm like, and the only times I ever feel that way, I'm always like, is it me? Is it me? Am I the weakest? Is it me? Like, no, we're all good. We're all great. Yeah. Black excellence. Okay. Moving on. And that's something that I feel very proud about, like to work with eight people, like seven people. I, I counted myself in the eight, uh, to work with seven people that I can look at. And I was like, I respect your work. I respect your funny and your point of view. It does have that vibe. I mean, that show is is all over the place for 23, 25 minutes at a time, however long the episodes are. I mean, there are a lot of different sketches jammed into that amount of time. It is it is evident that there are a lot of different viewpoints that go into it and that everybody's uh, viewpoint is actually making the final cut because they, I mean, if, as standalone pieces, those sketches have in almost every case, nothing to do with each other. There's not like callbacks from one to the next. They don't relate. They are, they're standalone things. So, um, that's cool that you've been able to get eight different points of view together and, and mesh them into this one. I feel thing. fortunate. I, I, it's such a blessing because I'm like, wow, we did it. We, uh, love each other and we were able to create a really special thing together. Yeah. Good. Well, and so of uh, all these people must have other things going on and they're on their plate aside from Astronomy Club. I know you've got a ton going on. I looked at your IMDb yesterday and Jesus, it's like the it's a laundry list of, you know, 200 things that you've done over the last over the last decade and a half. Um, I mean, your girl's trying to hustle. I love paying my bills. Successfully hustling. I love paying bills. Uh, it, it makes me less anxious day to day. Uh, so what are you what are you up to outside of? The, the astronomy club so, context. So it's a few different things. I am like, I am an actor. Uh, I have started acting. That's actually what I did before I even like ventured into comedy. That's what I went to school for. So there's always that. And, you know, creating opportunities for myself. I'm working on and developing uh, a storytelling show that's uh based on my experiences as like a, a chronically ill person. Like I always joke that I was like, everybody remembers the sick kid they grew up with who like either had childhood cancer or had something else. Everybody like kind of remembers that, but like nobody ever thinks like, oh yeah, what happened to that kid? <laughs> did they grow up? Did they die? What did they do? And I always like wanted to uh, create a piece and I've been working on it and um uh, it's in the works. It's still in an early phase, but like to create something that really highlights that work because I'm really passionate about telling the stories of like the people who might be invisible, but like still have humor about illness. Yeah. Nice. nice. Yeah. I'm also writing uh, a lot of other things because uh, um, I'm in addition to everything, I'm also a TV writer and I was head writer for busy tonight, uh, rest in peace, uh, and the opposition, the opposition. I was a writer on that and I've written on various other projects and 
Uh, I find it really satisfying. And I always joke, I was like, I suffer from all the glory and uh, pain of being a multi-hyphenate. Recently, I directed my first uh, um, project. It was uh, two episodes of a streaming show and uh, produced through an organization called The Color of Change. And that was really cool. So it's like, oh, I'm directing now too. So uh, the good and the bad, I was like, uh, the IMD page, IMDB page grows because I was like, I will keep hustling. I just, I really love the world of entertainment and I have a passion for it. And comedy, obviously. So as as an actor and a writer, and I would imagine that a lot of the other Astronomy Club members probably have similar backgrounds in both. I mean, coming up at the UCB, there's a lot of of improvisation that's happening. I was wondering, as I was watching uh, the um, that Cat Williams yes. sketch yesterday, I was wondering how much of it is you guys in a writer's room figuring out what it's going to be and how much of it is getting to set with a basic outline and an idea and then just letting your your improv muscles flex it's so funny because I feel like it's more of it was more we start with like maybe some loose ideas that we improvised or we picked up and then we scripted it because we did like a proper writer's room and then obviously there's room for improv but a lot of it was like fairly scripted and yeah. a lot of that um which I think speaks to the talent of everyone as an actor and a performer it seemed like, well, it hardly matters what it seemed like. I was, I was wondering if he had just, uh, the guy who played Cat had brought a lot to the, um, to the set that day, but was keeping it a secret from everybody else and was able, was just throwing. No, that's just James the Third. I love James the Third, even though we give him a lot of shit on the show. Uh, he as the guy who's not stepping up, right? As the guy who's not, yeah, not bringing we, anything we, to the table. We literally shit on him a lot throughout <laughs> the show, but he is really just so talented, and like that isn't like an a uh, on day for James. That's just the barometer for James. So like that's like where he comes every day. So so that was this is I mean the the name of the group Astronomy Club is uh, uh, stars are a nerdy thing. Yeah. And what Cat Williams' character, James the Third as Cat Williams, going for Romeo and Juliet and diving deep into into Shakespeare is uh, uh, could be perceived as a, a nerdy pastime as well. Who was, I'm wondering, who did you guys see as the, uh, the, the audience for Astronomy Club, the sketch show? Did you see it as focusing on a, a nerdy group? Did you see it as appealing more broadly or who did you really, who do you envision watching this show? I think we all, eight of us are so different. And I think we, in many ways, wrote the show for our younger selves. Like in the sense that like for people who uh, we know and we like and like, you know, the diaspora of the black experience is so vast and like it is nerdy it is weird we get silly we get goofy and those are the things that we all are collectively and I think uh, we all brought to the table so we really wrote it for people who look like us and the vast differences of that that we all grew up in different parts of the country we all have like different family makeups, different racial makeups, different economic makeups, just a lot of difference. But we all are able to unite over our black experience and our comedic experience. And the fact that we do all have like a nerd slant to everything. Like Shantane, uh, who like got to meet one of his idols being from East Palo Alto, like that was like a beautiful moment. So it's like, we all have that spirit. So I think we're, we all have a little bit of the nerd streak. So obviously we're going to appeal to comedy nerds. Obviously we're going to appeal to that uh, section, but like we really wrote it in a generously selfish way of like, I want to appeal to people who have experiences like us and eight people is a pretty large collection of people with different experiences sure. to like send it out into the world. 
I wanted to wear my then this is I wanted to wear something that was somewhat representative of of my experience of yeah. your show. So this is the nerdiest t-shirt I have with uh, <gasps> Yep. Nikola, I love it. Nikola Tesla on the uh -huh. current side and and mm -hmm. Thomas Edison on the direct current side. I mean Thomas Edison Ooh, nasty. Sorry, yeah, I yeah, have a yeah, lot yeah. of issues with uh, Edison. This is just me loving history. That's one of the things. I yeah. really love history. I'm a nerd for that. Well, and Tesla's a lovable dude, and Thomas Edison is not a lovable I mean, dude. And George Westinghouse, man, those guys were sharks. It, the early makings of America, like, I, I didn't realize how gangster some of these players were. Like, Tesla sh should have been remembered uh, more greatly. And I, I mean, there's part of me who has like, yeah, I guess having a very expensive electric car <laughs> keeps his name in everybody's uh, mouths, but they don't know what it means. So uh, catch me too. Yeah. But yeah, that's a, I, I respect the t-shirt. That's what I'm really trying to say. Good. I didn't have one that reflected the diaspora of the black experience, nor am I sure that that would be a good look on me if I, I mean, did actually wear that t-shirt. So this, we, I but could maybe do that. I'd but look it, at you side eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, might not be the best decision for me to yeah. wear that, that particular t-shirt. Another thing that I wanted to tell you, um, actually, Nikola Tesla died in this building. For real. What? That happened. Yeah, he died on the 33rd floor of this building. Um, that is... So cool. I love New York history. So I used to write on the opposition and, you know, we dealt a lot with like alt-right culture and uh, conspiracy theories. And it was really satisfying when we found out that where we recorded the show, uh, there was, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the CIA, uh, uh, program, but, uh, there's a documentary, I think it was called Wormwood. Uh, was it Errol Morris? Someone's going to fact check me anyway, that, uh, the person was pushed out of a building and it may, uh, have been a CIA plot, but it happened in that hotel. Wow. <laughs> and I, we were like, holy crap, a huge actual conspiracy <laughs> happened in the same building where a huge conspiracy, where we do conspiracies. Yeah. I love that. I yeah. love that shit. In a, a relatively boring looking building, relatively boring elevator down a relatively boring hallway that there is history that is like, you know, country affecting, if not world affecting things have happened in these, in these places behind, you know, have no idea what's going on t two doors down from here. So... Not to get full nerd, but like, so this is a building where that was hotel rooms. So he died in a hotel. He did. So he lived here for the last 15 years of his life because in, in the New Yorker hotel in the sub basement, there's a massive power generator that doesn't work anymore, but it did in the thirties and forties when he was doing his experiments. So he set up this lab because he had access to a huge amount of electricity. And so in room 3327, he set up his laboratory and just worked here for the last 15 years of his life. That's so cool. Yeah. I love history. <laughs> I love it so, so much. <laughs> Me too. This is, thank you for the, totally going along with me on that, on that digression. I'm glad that you were right there with me the whole I, time. I uh, just watched uh, one of the Nikola Tesla episodes on Doctor Who. So I'm like all about it. I love Doctor Who. Speaking of nerds, like, ugh. I love it so we, much. What was her the the current doctor is what what's the actress's name? I'm uh, spacing on this. She was Jody, just um, Whitaker. Jody Whitaker. Thank you. Yeah, she was just here doing doing this. Not with me. Somebody else was interviewing her, but she was just sitting in that very stool and uh, talking to that very microphone like a month ago. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um that I'm speechless. I'm like, <gasps> she was as, as I touch it as if I can catch her DNA. <laughs> Um, and that would mean something or anything, but yeah, I love, I love Dr. Who. I yeah. can't, I can't help it. The ups, the downs, Ugh. I will watch that show forever and I've watched the old ones too. Um, obviously not the lost ones. I could talk Dr. Who for a while. <laughs> 
I wanted to, so one of the things that I do want to talk about also since, so I don't think you got a chance to, to poke around here at all, but these are tapes going all the way back to 1952. There's wow. uh, Ella Fitzgerald from 1953. It's Carlos Santana's 1973 South American tour next to Elvis Costello and Iggy Pop and Loretta Lynn and John Coltrane. There's just, we're sitting in front of a bunch of music history. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of the, of the soundtrack to astronomy clubs. They noticed, I mean, I saw, heard Travis Scott on it, heard uh, a boogie with the hoodie who, I mean, he's a Bronx guy. This, this very room actually was used at, by uh, KRS one's producer, a dude named commissioner Gordon Williams, who that was his control room in this very room. KRS one cut a bunch of, of his records. So, I mean, that's a Bronx guy. And, um, here we are sitting here right now. I wanted to ask you about the importance of some of those songs. Like how, how involved was the, were all, were the eight of you in the soundtrack selection? Was that something that went oh, like we hand cared. in hand? Yeah. <laughs> we so cared a lot. So you didn't hand that off to a no, third no, party to say like, here. It was a, very much on. a discussion because uh, music is very important to us as a group. And we wanted the show to have a feel and a vibe that like, definitely reflected our New York side. And, you know, uh, with uh, our, our celeb cameo we had, that is... And that's um, a secret we're not talking about. Um, well, I don't want to ruin it. Yeah, I won't, I'll I won't it ruin it. I was just about but, to. It was on the tip of my tongue and but, I almost messed it up but earlier. But it's because, you know, like Shantane, I, I will say, is the person who... Um, he may go broke one day because he has a mansion full of vinyl. Like <laughs> that man, uh, loves his vinyl and like there, as a group, we weren't going to let that aspect of the show just slip away. So it was important to us. And there was a lot of conversations about it because the good of having eight people who are like so individually talented is everyone has a lot of opinions, which is great when you have to make a lot of decisions. And like music was just one more decision we had to make where someone would take the lead. We'd all go, yay, nay. We'd pitch why we liked something or why we didn't. So it, it was, it, but it was also interesting because we were all doing it remote. So in my head, that means everybody would put on some earphones and be like, huh, is this a good one for us? And we'd come to our own conclusions and somehow we all agreed eventually, eventually we all agreed. Well, probably based on the strength of pitches when somebody gives you a well-reasoned, well-thought-out answer to why this is a good thing. I mean, wishy-washiness doesn't help anybody in that, in that situation. Having a clear opinion as to why you think the thing you think is, you know, probably very helpful in driving this whole thing forward when there are eight drivers at the same time. And it's about the good of the whole show. I think that has always been something that's very important to me. I grew up playing sports and I see any like sketch group or an improv group or a group of people, like we're all collected here to like get to one point. We all have our different roles. We all have our different strengths, weaknesses, but our eye is on one prize. And I feel like that all of that coalesced around the show. And I'm very proud of it because I feel like it's, very different. Like the sketches aren't really connected, but it it's cohesive in a way considering how vast it is. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. I enjoyed it. And I, one thing about the soundtrack before we move on that I just found out Googling around, um, speaking of history, did you know Juice World, rest in peace, Juice World, um, passed away two days after your show premiered. That timing like almost exactly lined up. We did know about that we were chatting internally about it and we were like, Oh, Oh, Oh. <laughs> uh, Cause we, we talk about those things because it like those things impact some members of the group very strongly. Like if a legend passes or somebody who like is a music influence or um, like a comedic influence passes. We like, we literally run to each other and are like, did you hear? Uh, so yeah, we did. <laughs> and we yeah. talked about it yeah. and we had our internal feels and then some people had their more public feels, but yeah, yeah. I, I was like, Oh yeah, I forgot about that. But December 6th feels like seven years ago. 
that's just the world we live in, right? Like everything yeah. just feels like forever. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've consumed the entire thing and I'm ready for what is, what's next. Can you talk about, I mean, as much or as little as you want, want to volunteer about what Keisha Zoller personally is up to or about what Astronomy Club is up to? Is there a season two? Is there a, what are we, what are you working on right now? Um, so I'm, Personally, I'm working on uh, some writing projects that I'm very excited about and seem to be progressing forward in a very wonderful light. I'm also working on doing some more storytelling uh, that hopefully in the late spring you can look for me touring um, uh, with some folks. And I think Astronomy Club, we have a lot of things uh, going on that uh, transcend beyond the sketch space. And we're very excited to uh, keep the hustle and bustle of Astronomy Club uh, happening. And I'm very, I'm, I'm really excited because we have a lot of ideas. We have pages of ideas. Like, you, you, no one knows all the things we have inside us. And all I will say, it's vast. It's a lot. I hope you're ready to the world, not to, to you, but also the world. <laughs> yes, I'm ready. I'm looking forward to it. It, it is evident just watching that, uh, watching Astronomy Club, that there are the, that the idea cup is overflowing. And so I'll stay tuned for what happens next. And congratulations on what's happening right now. Um, Astronomy Club. The sketch show, it's out on Netflix. It's been out since December 6th. And um, everybody who's watching this right now ought to please uh, watch that show. Thank you, Keisha, very much thank for coming you. by and doing this. We appreciate it. And, um, and thank you for watching, everybody. All right.